and we are now going to talk about more importance of the leading term. That is the degree. This is a polynomial of degree five. Degree five. That means the most, the maximum number of real zeros you can have is five. Real zeros means they're numbers on the x-axis. The maximum number of x-intercepts you can have is five. The maximum number of turning points, max, maximum points and minimum points, these are turning points. The relative maxima and, and relative minima are turning points. So the maximum number that a degree five polynomial can have is one less than the degree or four. That's it. That's as hard as this part gets. Okay, this polynomial here, degree eight. That means the maximum number of real zeros, points on the x-axis, that you can have is eight. The maximum number of x-intercepts you can have is eight. Since the x-intercepts, when they're real, I mean, never mind that. The x-intercepts are made from the real zeros. The maximum number of turning points, though, is seven. Do there have to be seven? No, that's just the most you can have. That's all there is to it. I absolutely cannot make it more complicated than that. I think that's great stuff. You're going to need some points. You're going to be graphing this on my math lab, these problems. Graph the polynomial, graph the polynomial. Actually, most of it will be graphed for you. Okay, you know how my math lab does it. It wants two or three points and it'll ask you for them. So we have to find some points. Let's find the intercepts. Those are the easiest. OK, so here we have a fifth degree polynomial. OK, that means you can have at a maximum five real zeros. And well, let's see, let's set it equal to zero and find some X intercepts. That is, find the zeros, and we can make x-intercepts from the zeros. So x to the fifth minus 3x to the fourth equals zero. Now this is going to give us our zeros. All right, well, I can factor this by GCF. I can pull out a common factor, that's what I'm going to do. And since the leading term is negative, I'll pull out a negative GCF. Here I go. Um, both of these terms contain x to the fourth. So if I pull out a negative x to the fourth, then I'll be left with x plus 
three. Now let me show you how I did that. <clears throat> I said to myself, if I were to pull out a negative X to the fourth, then what would I have to multiply this position by to get negative X to the fifth? And the answer is just X to the one. X to the four times X to the one is X to the five. But since this is negative, this has to be positive. Because negative times positive is negative. And the same thing here. I have to be able to get a minus three X to the fourth back. So what do I have to multiply negative X to the fourth by in order to get negative three X to the fourth? Well, I'm going to have to make that three positive because negative times positive is negative. And then all I'm lacking when I have negative X to the fourth is the three. So that's how I got it to be three. I just sort of did it in my head. Equals zero. Okay, now, negative X to the fourth equals zero. So I can multiply or divide both, either both sides of this by negative one, and I'll get X to the fourth equals zero. So clearly X equals zero, right? Zero to the fourth power is zero, but if you want to, you can say X times X times X times X equals zero. And then you set each factor equal to zero. So X equals zero and X equals zero and X equals zero and X equals zero. So zero is a zero and it occurs four times. Now that does have an effect on the graph. We are gonna put it in the graphing calculator, but again, to do this in my math lab, you're gonna to have to have some points. X plus three equals zero. I tried it. I tried it first, so you do have to come up with some points. Subtract three, subtract three. So I'll have X equals negative three. Negative three is a zero, but it occurs only once. Okay, now let's get the Y intercept just in case you need it. All right, these are we can make X, um, uh, X intercepts from these. They're real numbers. So you're going to have the point zero, zero occurring twice, and you're going to have the point negative three, zero occurring once. And um, yeah, F of zero is how you find the Y intercept. I'll write it up here. OK, so that means I plug a zero in there and a zero in there and I'll have negative zero to the fifth minus three times zero to the fourth. And what could that possibly be but zero? I didn't shouldn't have marked through that. That's rude. There, that's zero. So X is zero, Y is zero. Oops. That gives us the point zero, zero. But of course we had that over here anyway. So you've got two good points you can graph. And I forget if it asks you for three. Let's take a look at what this looks like because there's some information I need to give you about what effect do multiplicities have on a graph? Okay, 
So we are going to have there. Well, okay. Temporarily. Negative x caret 5 come down. Minus, not negative, this one's minus. 3 x caret 4 come down. And now I'm going to graph it. Okay. Now we can change the window to, um, I don't know, negative 20 to 20. Actually, I don't have to do that, but I'm doing it anyway. Negative 20, maybe negative 30. But I am going to change these back to negative 10. I don't need to go that far. Negative 10 to 10. OK, let's graph this. Yeah, it's a little better. OK, this is what your graph looks like. Here's the zero that occurs at negative three zero, the x-intercept rather, that occurs at negative three zero. And now look at this. Remember the point zero zero occurs four times. When you have zeros that occur at a higher multiplicity than two, so not two, but at a higher multiplicity, even multiplicity, like four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, you're going to have this flattening effect. Now first, any even multiplicity is going to leave the graph on the same side. And it will come up and kiss the x-axis and go back down. That's what even multiplicities do. But for even multiplicities higher than two, like four, there's a flattening effect. On the other hand, for multiplicities of one, you're always going to have the graph cut through, cleanly cut through the x-axis from one side to the other, from top to bottom. Do you have to know this? No, I'm just telling you. Good, wanted to make sure I was recording. I suddenly get these little worries. I just wanted you to know that all this multiplicity stuff does have an effect. Okay, now we have to graph the polynomial in my math lab, which means you have to have two or three points. Incidentally, you were able to find two points. Um, if you need another one, then yeah, here it is. Let's go back here. If you, if you click the second button and then the graph button, you'll come up with a whole bunch of points. Now, don't, don't graph that. That's way too high. But on the other hand, something like negative 1, negative 2, 0, 0, 1, negative 4, like that, or negative 3, 0, like that, those are our easy points to, to go ahead 
and you can find them on your grid. You have to always worry about, am I going to find the points I choose on my grid? Okay, now one more. Graph the polynomial. Well, we need information. For instance, the absolute easiest point to find at any time or place is H of zero because that gives you this. So what have you got? With all this, just think of it as being zero. Zero minus four is negative four. Your y-intercept is negative four on the x on the y-axis. Negative four on the y-axis, or the point zero negative four. Now to find the x-intercepts, you have to find the zeros first. We're going to do that by x to the third plus four x squared. And again, uh, 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 don't do that. That will guarantee it's wrong. Plus negative x minus 4. So we'll have x squared times x minus 4, uh, plus 4 squared. Don't skip steps, Rademacher. Here, negative 1. Okay. So, see how to make this easier for you. Negative x minus 4. Well, that's negative 1 times x plus negative 1 times positive 4. And we pull out a negative 1. Okay, so we'll have negative 1 times x plus 4. Now, I completely forgot my equals 0. That means you're finding x-intercepts or zeros. You're finding zeros and you're going to take the zeros and turn them into, into x-intercepts. So now x plus 4 is the GCF. I pull it out to the front. Then I'm going to multiply that by the leftovers, x squared minus 1. And this is the same exact problem we had before. That's still factorable. x plus 4 equals 0, and x squared minus 1 equals 0. So we'll come down. This will be x squared. <laughs> no, it won't. This will be x plus 1 times x minus 1 equals 0. So we'll have x plus 1 equals 0, x minus 1 equals 0. Now we'll solve minus 4 minus 4. x equals negative 4. Minus 1, minus 1. X equals negative 1. Plus 1, plus 1. X equals positive 1. You now have more points than you're going to need. This is, a, the zeros of the function are negative 4 zeros. negative four, negative one, and one, and the x-intercepts are negative four comma zero, negative one comma zero, 
and one comma zero. And this is highest power three. So that's all the zeros you can get. They'll all have multiplicity one, which means you're going to have a graph that cuts through the x-axis. There's none of this lingering and then going back the other way. So let's take a quick look at it. Now I'm going to put my screen back to um, standard form. So zoom six will take me to Z standard. Okay, and then I will Y and clear, and then I will put um, Here we go, I'll put that in. X carrot three. Nah, all right. Plus, uh -uh, look what happens. I'm happily just going along. See, that's why you have to come down first. Let's start again and pay attention to what I am doing. X caret three, come down, plus four X squared. Notice if you use the square key, you don't have to come back down because you're already down. Minus X, minus four. There you go. This is a typical cubic function. Excuse me. With with three nice real zeros that make three nice x intercepts and you've got the graph cutting through the x axis. Boom, boom, boom. Here are the turning points. Highest power 3, so you've got two turning points. This is just beautiful. I love this. OK, relative maximum, relative minimum. Points. This is all very nice. OK, this is it for this page. Yay! Okay. When you're graphing these, look at the uh, uh, after you hit the the uh, uh, the key that brings up the graph, the little gray box that picks that brings up the graph. Look at the yellow banner right above the graph. OK, it'll tell you what to do step by step. Why do we care about zeros other than the fact that they're X intercepts? Why would we care even about X intercepts? And the answer is that polynomials are used to forecast economic trends, among other things. And the zeros are very, very important, but the zeros are more important than you might imagine because the whole polynomial itself is generated from the zeros. The zeros come first and then they act like little generators. They generate the polynomial. We are going to generate some polynomials. So, here is a polynomial of degree three with real coefficients that ha that well that has the given zeros, the one that we're going to make. Here it is. You have, and you must memorize, so you must write it down on a flashcard. However you memorize things. This is a very important formula. 
This is the formula for how zeros make polynomials. Often it's called, often you'll see the letter P. It all depends on the book, but P for polynomial. Here, because we're told that this is uh, a polynomial of degree three, that means there will be only three zeros. This is whatever zero one is, this is whatever zero two is, this is whatever zero three is. And notice that this is A, but right now they're not talking about it. So we're not gonna talk about it, but there's an A there that for now is just going to be one. That makes it invisible, okay? So if it's one, you can't see it. Now, Z1, I can come over here, and since these are in this order, I'll just say that this is Z1, this is Z2, and this is Z3. And we are going to generate a polynomial based on what those zeros are. Thank you. Mailman. X minus negative one. X minus two, X minus negative four. Okay, now that'll give me X plus one times X minus two times X plus four. Now, you'll find out over time what order you want to do this in. Not supposed to end sentences with prepositions, but I just did. What I usually do is this just based on years of doing it this way and finding it easier for me. I let the guy in front, the factor in front, wait. And I'm going to multiply these together. So X will multiply X. X will multiply 4. Negative 2 will multiply X. And negative 2 will multiply positive 4. So we will have X squared plus 4x minus 2x minus 8. Now, we're going to combine these two like terms. So we'll have x plus 1 times x squared plus 2x minus eight. Okay, that's where I'm at right now. Now, I'm going to take this X and multiply it by X squared, two X and negative eight. But that's kind of hard, so you're going to see I do something else. And then 1, it's kind of hard to keep 
all of this in order. So you might find that it's much easier to take this X and multiply it by X squared plus 2X minus 8. It's kind of going to an extra step, but I think it's worthwhile. And then take the plus 1. So I'll make a little dashed line going over here. Plus 1 times x squared plus 2x minus 8. See, this way you're doing the same thing. The x is going to go to the x squared, to the 2x, and to the minus 8. But you kind of keep it in, you can actually see your steps in front of you if you do it this way. So I'm going to do it that way. X to the third plus 2X squared minus 8X plus 1 times X squared, that'll be plus X squared, plus 1 times 2X, that'll be plus 2X plus one times minus eight, that'll be minus eight. Now I get my like terms together. Thank you. Thank goodness my dog food got here. We were getting down to the bitter end. Lunch was gonna be it. All right, now my dog won't eat me. All right, here we go. I've got one X to the third term. And I've got one minus eight term. I've got two X squared terms right here. Two X squared plus X squared is plus three X squared. And minus 8x plus 2x is minus 6x. So let me, let me do this. These guys go together. Okay, now putting it all back together, these three zeros have just built a polynomial. busy little guys. Polynomial P of X, or F of X, or G of X, or anything you want to call it. X to the third plus three X squared minus six X minus eight. That's what zeros do. They build polynomials, then the polynomials are used to forecast whatever it is you're looking for. You've got to use this formula. I'm going to write it again. P of X. Here's the whole formula for a cubic. A times X minus the first zero times X minus the second zero times X minus the third zero. And as you know now, A, A provides the stretch or the shrink the vertical stretch or vertical shrink. So you can have an infinite number of polynomials that are built from the same zeros just by changing your A. Let's do another one. All right, ooh, look, look what our zeros are. 
is just the number three. Nothing scary there, but Z2 will be 10i. And Z3 will be negative 10i. They're conjugates of each other. You're going to find that in the polynomials we build in this class, whenever you have a 10i, you're going to have its conjugate negative 10i. Whenever you have negative 10i, you're going to have its conjugate positive 10i. Complex numbers will always occur together. Here, just by way of a little bit of review, i is the square root of negative 1 in that much larger number system, the complex number system, and our real number system is a smaller number system inside the complex number system. This is our world right here. This is a world where the, the uh, um, a dimension that really exists, where the rules are a little bit different, where you can have the square roots of negative numbers. And they really exist. The square root of negative 16 is 4i. Yes, yes, really exists. Um, if you're going to be a, an electrical engineer, you're going to be working with those. They're necessary to describing alternating current. OK, anyway, back to what we're doing. We are building a polynomial from these three zeros and we're letting a equal one. So let us begin. Here's the formula, might as well put the A there. Okay, so A is one, so it becomes invisible. It's there, but it, if it equals one, it's invisible. Okay, then we're gonna have X minus three times X minus 10 I times X minus negative 10 I. So that will be X minus three times X minus 10 I times X plus 10 I. OK. Now this is principally the reason why I always do the last two together. When you multiply conjugates, great things happen. Now, I'm here to help you remember what you discovered in a previous class. I'm gonna skip a step here. Not skip a step, skip a line. X minus three times X, well, let me get my little arrows going here. X times X, X times 10I, negative 10i times x and negative 10i times 10i. So we're going to have x squared plus 10i times 
times x minus tn i times x minus 10 times times 10 is 100. 100 i times i is i squared. But of course, if I square both sides of this, I'll have i squared equals the square root of negative one squared. And when you square a square root, you get what's underneath, especially if you are in the complex number system. So, um, rather than square in our number system, that two would have been taken underneath and turn the negative one into a one because negative one squared is one, and then the square root of one is one, but we are not, whenever we have i's, we're in the complex number system. So we have to play by their rules. So when you square the square root, you get negative one. I squared is negative one. Okay, 10i times x minus 10i times x is zero. And that's what happens when you multiply complex conjugate numbers. You lose that middle term that has the i, and the i squared turns into negative one. Plus zero minus 100 times negative one. And we are still in this second set of parentheses, which I probably should have left as brackets. I can see I should have now. Equals, I still haven't used x minus three yet. I will eventually. Okay, this is gonna be x squared. Negative 100 times negative one is plus 100. Now I have a binomial times a binomial. If you know FOIL, you can do that. Or if you don't, we're just gonna do what we usually do when we multiply a binomial times a binomial. X is gonna multiply X squared. X is gonna multiply 100. Negative three is gonna multiply X squared. Negative three is gonna multiply 100. And so we are going to have P of X equals X times X squared is X to the third. X times positive 100 is positive 100 X. minus 3x squared minus 300. So now all we have to do is put this in descending order. x to the third minus 3x squared plus 100 times x minus 3 100. So as you can see, we can have complex zeros. We'll talk about what they mean later. Okay, you always come back to using this formula.
and then you just work carefully from there. Same thing here. Now we've got what are called irrational zeros. The square root of three and negative the square root of three have got to occur together under certain circumstances, which we'll talk about later, not now. These are zeros. So, I am going to let, oh, oh, these are called irrational zeros. Names are important. Um, let's go back here. 10i and negative 10i. are complex conjugate zeros. Three is a rational zero. We like rational numbers. We don't much like complex conjugate or irrational numbers. So this is a rational zero. Important to know the names though, so that you know what you're doing. Here, these are irrational zeros. They're real numbers. They're on the x-axis, but they're irrational. On the other hand, four is a rational zero. And together, they are going to build a polynomial. So if we let Z1 equal the square root of three and Z2 equal negative the square root of three and Z3 equal four, then our P of X, which equals A times X minus Z1 times x minus z2 times x minus z3. Is going to be P of x. We're letting a equal one right now. It won't always. minus C1, yeah. X minus the square root of three, X minus negative the square root of three, X minus four. All right, that'll be X minus the square root of three, times x plus the square root of three times x minus four. Now these are conjugates, okay? It's always easier to multiply conjugates, so let's do that. Get them out of the way first, because they're certainly the ugliest, but it is actually a wonderful thing. When you multiply these, 
you're going to have x squared plus the square root of 3 times x minus the square root of 3 times x minus the square root of 3 squared minus the square root of 3 plus the square root of 3. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is the square root of 3 squared. Times x minus 4. Okay, now these are 0, right? So this is going to be x squared plus 0 because the square root of 3x minus the square root of 3x is 0 minus the square root of 3 squared is just 3 times x minus 4. So what we're going to have over here is x squared minus 3 times x minus 4. And then we're just going to multiply these. x squared times x, x squared times minus 4, minus 3 times x, minus 3 times minus 4. And that will give us x to the third minus 4x minus 3x plus 12 because negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12. So this is x to the third minus 7x. Miss Barbara. Yes. I think it's uh, negative 4x squared. It is, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Didn't even see that. Okay. Yes, it is, by golly gosh. All right. X to the third minus 4x squared minus 3x plus 12. So actually, it is done minus 4x squared minus 3x plus 12. There's our polynomial that was generated by these three zeros. We have one more to do. And this one is kind of hard because our irrational zeros are our irrational zeros are 5 plus the square root of 7 5 minus the square root of 7, and then our rational 0 is 2. So let's write that down because you're going to need that next week. Incidentally, your test is in two weeks. Just letting you know. Um, okay, so 2 is a rational zero. The value of rational zeros is that you know immediately what they equal exactly. When you've got irrational zeros, the closest you're going to get is a calculator approximation. So the it's so much better to be able to have an exact answer. 5 plus the square root of 7 and 
5 minus the square root of 7. are irrational zeros. Something is irrational when it can never be made into a fraction. Two can be made into a fraction just by putting it over one. Or four over two or eight over four. Anything that equals two. All right, so. Here we go, we're going to build a, a P of X. With this. A equals one. So it will be invisible. X minus, ah, uh, all right. It really is going to be better for me to use brackets. It's not wrong if you just use parentheses, but it's messier. Five plus the square root of seven. Times X minus. 5 minus the square root of 7. Times x minus 2. Okay, you're going to have to watch what I do really, really closely. These are steps. When you've got two part irrational zeros, this is what you have to do when you're building a polynomial. Step one. Distribute the minus sign here and here x minus 5 minus the square root of 7. I'm going to distribute the minus sign here. x minus 5 plus the square root of 7. And then this guy out here who's not doing anything for a while, just sitting there. Okay, now. Do this. Notice that X minus five matches X minus five. I'm going to put parentheses around x minus 5. Now just think about that. If you're working on your own, you do it too at home. There's a reason I did that. And here it is. What we have here are conjugates. Where you've got A, I'm letting X minus five equal A. You're gonna have A minus B. Times a plus B. When you multiply A minus B times A plus B,
the A multiplies the A, the A multiplies the B. The minus B multiplies the A, the minus B multiplies the B. You're going to have A squared minus A B minus B A minus B squared. But we're multiplying the A times the B and the B minus A, and when you're multiplying, order doesn't matter. So you've got A squared minus A B minus. No, that's plus. A times B, that's a plus B. So plus A B minus A B. B times A and A times B are the same thing. Minus B squared. Now, positive AB minus AB is zero. You'll have A squared plus zero minus B squared, which is just A squared minus B squared. That's what you do with conjugates. That's what we're going to do here. My A is X minus 5. My B is the square root of 7. So since I've got A minus B times A plus B, that will give me A squared minus B squared which means don't forget that poor little guy. All the excitement is happening in front. Since A is X minus five, I will have X minus five squared minus the square root of 7, which is b, squared, times x minus 2, which is not doing anything right now. That's the reason I did it. <coughs> the alternative is a very long multiplication here. That'll co totally cause your brains to drip out. This makes it quick. But you have to write it so that you've got the A's matching and the B's matching. And the op opposite sign in the middle. Okay, anyway, um, X minus five squared is x minus 5. I mean, you've got enough work from this. x minus 5 minus the square root of 7 squared is minus 7 times x minus 2, and we will get to x minus 2 eventually. That'll be x squared minus 5x minus 5x plus 25 minus 7 times x minus 2. Okay, so this is going to be x squared minus 10x plus 25 minus 7 is going to be plus 18 times x minus 2. Ha! Huh. Almost done. No, well, we're closer to being, at least we're done with the ugly part. Okay. Now, The longer um, polynomial is in front, but we're still going to do this the same way. 
I'm going to take the x square and multiply it by what's in parentheses here, the minus 10x, multiply it by what's in parentheses, and the 18, and multiply it by what's in parentheses. So we will have x squared times x minus 2 minus 10x times x minus 2 plus 18 times x minus 2. Now, almost done. x squared times x, x squared minus 2. Negative 10x times x, whoop, negative 10x times minus 2. 18 times x, 18 times minus 2. That'll be x to the third minus 2x squared minus 10x squared plus 20x plus 18x minus 36. So we have P of X equals X to the third. Okay, I take away 2X squared. I take away another 10X squared minus 12X squared. I add 20X and then I add another 18X. That'll be plus 38X minus 36. Oh my golly gosh. Suppose you have two zeros. Negative I and 2 minus the square root of 11 are zeros. What are the other zeros? If you want the coefficients of the of the variables to not be weird looking like this or this you have got to have the conjugates involved. So, and that's what it says. Suppose a polynomial function of degree four with rational coefficients. That's numbers like two or negative five thirds. Not these. So, if you've got negative I as a zero, that means you have to have its conjugate positive i as a zero. And if you have an irrational zero, two minus the square root of 11 as a zero, then you must have its conjugate two plus the square root of 11. Now you've got one, two, three, four zeros. And that's what it says the degree will be, four. So that's all you have to do is type those in here. Let's look at some others. We could just whiz through these. Now, here you've got a polynomial with rational coefficients. These are the zeros. You've got negative four, The square root of two, this is problem two. This is problem one. Okay, the square root of two and seven fifths. Well, negative four and seven fifths are rational.
They're what you want. You don't want to change them. You want to change this. That means there has to be the conjugate of the square root of two, which is negative the square root of two. Add this. Up here, what you're going to add is the conjugate of negative i, which is i, and the conjugate of two minus the square root of 11, which is two plus the square root of 11. That will ensure that you do not have any i numbers in your polynomial, and you do not have any ir irrational numbers. Just nice rational numbers. Okay, here's another one like the first one. I and two minus the square root of seven. You don't want those numbers. I mean, you don't want there to be numbers like that in front of the variables in your polynomial. So, to make sure you don't have that, you need the conjugate of i, which is negative i. You need the conjugate of two minus the square root of seven, which is two plus the square root of seven. Number four. The zeros you're told that you have are 5i, 0, and negative 8. You like 0 and negative 8, but we don't like 5i, so we're going to have to match it up with its conjugate, negative 5i. So that's all they're asking you to do. The other zero is, which is what this is saying over and over again. What are the other zeros? The other zero is. Well, here I would type negative 5i. But let's get done. Then maybe I'll come back and do some. Okay, now, here, number five. You've got zeros. There's a polynomial and it has the zeros. There's a polynomial with rational coefficients. That is integers and fractions. Now, somebody comes up to you and says, one of the zeros is three plus five i, and another zero is two plus the square root of five. Well, if you're going to have rational coefficients, then the other zeros are going to have to be 3 minus 5i, the conjugate of this, and 2 minus the square root of 5, which is the conjugate of that. 